On today's program, Andrew Womack will inspire you to reach out and take the healing that is yours in Jesus Christ. God wants you well, and that's the gospel truth. Now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the gospel truth. Today, I'm into my third week of teaching on the subject that God wants you well. And I tell you, I have covered a lot of material already. This last week, I was trying to dispel what I consider to be wrong teaching, wrong interpretation about Paul's thorn in the flesh. And I've already gone through this. I won't go back over it. I would like to recommend that you please get these materials because this is something that you need to go over and make sure that you get it established. Plus, there's people that you know who I can guarantee you have been told that God gave Paul some sickness and refused to take it away because he was better off being sick. And you will need this to be able to share with other people. So please take advantage of it for your sake as well as being able to share this with other people. And, you know, we've been advertising this now for three weeks, but we've put together what I call a better health care package. And it's my CD teaching, my DVD teaching, a brand new book entitled God Won't You Well, a study guide specifically designed to help you teach other people these truths about healing. And then I have a CD that actually has a woman reading the healing scriptures with this soothing music in the background. And people just play this so that the Word of God can get established in their heart. And uh, it seems like that we have something else in there. But anyway, they'll give you all the information about it. But it's just a powerful... Oh, we have two volumes on healing journeys, which is 10 testimonies of miraculous uh, healing testimonies. And so anyway, please get these materials. Now, I've been talking about Paul's thorn in the flesh. I won't go back through it, but let me just summarize it by saying it was not from God. It was from the devil. It wasn't given to make him humble. It was given to beat him down and wear him down, to buffet him and wear him out so that he wouldn't be effective. It wasn't sickness. It was persecution. It was a demonic messenger. That word messenger was translated angel. It was a demonic power that had come against him, and it just stirred up persecution, anti-Christ sentiments everywhere he went. And Paul tried to get uh, free from this, and yet the Lord finally told him that, you know, you aren't redeemed from persecution. You're just going to have to bear with it. Later, Paul wrote the scripture in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Yea, all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, that was towards the end of his ministry. It was one of his prison letters. And he had learned that through this encounter and probably other times. He had learned that, you know what, you can't get free from persecution. You can get free from sickness, but not from persecution. And so anyway, this was not some, some sickness or some disease. Now, remembering all of those things, and again, there's a lot more I said about that. Let's go over to Galatians chapter 4. And people who've interpreted Paul's thorn in the flesh as sickness will often refer you to Galatians to prove that Paul's thorn in the flesh was some sickness. Specifically, they believe it was a, an Aramaic disease that affected your eyes, and you had these runny, puffy eyes. You know, I've read all of this. I've heard people preach this, and it just amazes me how they come up with these obscure things and come up with these details. Look at this passage of Scripture. They will read this and apply this to the Apostle Paul and say that his thorn in the flesh was eye problems. In Galatians chapter 4, in verse 13, he says, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first. Now, I took quite a bit of time last week, I think it was, showing that the word infirmity means lack or inadequacy. I used Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 26, and 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, to show that the word infirmity there wasn't talking about sickness. Therefore, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, or chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, wasn't talking about sickness. It was talking about uh, the hardships and the struggles that come with persecution. So I went to great lengths to say that. To me, it's obvious from this context right here, verse 13, where he says, you know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, that this was talking about some kind of physical problem. And again, uh, the word infirmity means lack or inadequacy. It's not limited to a physical sickness, but it can be, in this instance, it sounds 
to me like that uh, the, the context just dictates that he says that when he first came to them, he had some infirmity in his flesh. In verse 14, he says, In my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them unto me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now, in this instance, I believe Paul is talking about that when he first came to the Galatians, he had something in his flesh, and they didn't despise him for it. Apparently, it was obvious. It was visible, and they didn't despise him or look down at him for it. And then he makes this statement in verse 15 that where's this blessedness? You would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And from this, people, this is where they came up with a belief. Paul had some kind of an eye problem. And then they go back and research uh, writings from that time and found out that there was a common malady where people had red, red, swollen, puffy eyes that made your eyesight dim and things like this. And so they put all of this together and come up with Paul's thorn in the flesh is this Aramaic disease that makes your eyes red and puffy and poor eyesight. Let me offer another explanation to this. Remember, he's writing to the Galatians. Galatians are people who lived in a uh, province. It was called Galatia. And you know what the main cities in Galatia were? Lystra, Derby, and Iconium. And Paul visited them a number of different times, and it was in Derby. Paul was preaching the gospel, and they stoned him and left him for dead. The scripture doesn't say he was dead, but if he wasn't dead, he was so close to being dead that the people who were stoning him to death thought he was dead and left, left him for dead. And it says, as the disciples stood round about him, that he rose up with them and went into town and the next day walked to the next town nearly 20 miles away. If he wasn't dead, he was really close to it. Personally, I kind of believe that he was dead and might have been raised from the dead as the believers pray. But if he wasn't dead, he was very close to it. And therefore, would it be impossible to believe that if you had just been stoned to death and then the next day you go 20 miles into the next town that you might have some kind of a problem in your flesh? <laughs> Amen. You could have uh, open wounds, cuts, lacerations, or however you say that. You could have black eyes. You could have knots on your head. You could have all kinds of problems. To just say that because he mentioned that he had some infirmity in his flesh when he first went to Galatia and, and in the scriptures, it's recorded that he was stoned and left for dead. And for you to just ignore this obvious connection and to go research and come up and say that he had some rough, uh, rough puffy eye disease, boy, that's just... If you're going to interpret Scripture that way, you can make the Scripture say anything. But, you know, if you would go to the Word, these are the Galatians, people that saw him when he was, was stoned and left for dead. And it's obvious that whatever his flesh was was probably associated with this stoning. And when he said in verse 15 that, Where is this blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them unto me. It's possible that Paul did have eye problems. If he did, it was just temporary because, again, in verse 13, he says, You know how through, at the first, through infirmity of the flesh I preached unto you. He made it very clear that this was at the first. In other words, he got over it. It wasn't something that he besought the Lord for and God wouldn't take it away from him. No, this is something that he had. It was temporary. And if it was eye problems for being stoned and left for dead, that would all make this understandable. Personally, I believe that this is probably an expression the same way as if I said, I'd give my right arm for you. Does that mean that your right arm's bad? No, but it's just a level of commitment. I'm so committed to you that you know what? I'd give my right arm for you. I'd give you the shirt off my back. Does that mean that you don't have a shirt? No, but it just means I'm willing, I'm committed to you to the point that I would actually act on it. I would give you the shirt off my back. I'd give you my right arm. We use those expressions and it doesn't mean that you aren't wearing a shirt and that you don't have a right arm. It's just an expression to say that I'd give you whatever I could to help you. And when Paul said that you would have plucked out your own eyes. It's, it's much easier for me to interpret this as he was probably just saying that, man, you love me so much that you would have given anything for me. 
And if you understand the purpose of the book of Galatians, he was writing to people that he led to the Lord, and yet in a very short period of time, the Jews from Jerusalem had come and talked them out of the grace of God, and they had gone back into legalism and preaching that you still had to be a Jew and you had to keep all the Jewish laws, and they were basically making Christ of none effect. It wasn't any longer what Jesus did for you. You had to do all of these things. And Paul is writing this letter to tell them, what about, you know, I'm your father. I'm the one that led you to faith in the Lord, and how could you have turned from me? And he says, at one time you would have given your own, you'd have plucked out your own eyes and have given it to me. He's just saying that at one time you'd have given anything, you'd have helped me anything. Even when I had this problem in the flesh, whether it was his eyes or something else, if it was just a figure of speech, he's saying at one time you'd have done anything for me. Praise God. That is so simple. And to me, people who are going to make the, this quantum leap from what the Scripture says and what the Word reveals about the conditions there in Galatian, Paul being stoned, and they're going to take, and they're going to uh, do away with the obvious interpretation, and they're going to go to all of these, you know, remote uh, sources and come up with something and just ascribe uh, an eye disease to Paul. To me, that is just totally irresponsible. Irresponsible. I mean, anybody who can interpret the word that way can make it say whatever they want it to. That's just wrong. None of these things that I've talked about says that Paul had some kind of an eye disease or thorn in the flesh that was a sickness and God wouldn't heal him. And let me use another scripture right here in the book of Galatians that people tie in with this same thing trying to make this point. In Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 11, he says, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. Now, what does that mean? Well, people have taken that to say that Paul had this eye disease, runny, puffy eyes that caused bad eyesight. And because of this, I heard one guy say that when Paul wrote, his characters were two and three inches tall. And so he wrote in huge letters because he had an eye disease that was his thorn in the flesh, and they knit all of these things together to try and make a point. You know what? In my Bible, the book of Galatians is one, two, three, four, five pages long, single space. This is small print. You know, if I was to write you a letter with these many words in it, it would not be inappropriate for me to, you see how large a letter talking about quantity, not size. And if you even look the Greek words up in uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, it's talking about quantity, not size in that sense. This isn't Paul saying that he wrote in two and three inch block letters. Can you imagine to put all of this writing? It takes up five pages. In my Bible, if he wrote every character was two or three inches tall, you couldn't have a, a book big enough to contain that thing. You could only get a couple of characters on one page. You know, I'm trying to be polite and restrain myself, but just how dumb can you get and still breathe? People have a predisposition, a judgment, a prejudice that they want to believe Paul was sick, and they are straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel to make that point. Just because he sees, says, you see how large a letter, he's talking about how many words he had written unto him, and he was talking about how much he loved them, and I, the reason I wrote so much is because I'm so concerned about you. He's not talking about how bad his eyes are and how big he had to write. When he says that he had an infirmity at the first, that means that it didn't last, and so this wasn't something that just lasted throughout his entire life. When he says you'd have plucked out your own eyes, I believe he, it's possible that he could have been talking literally, but he probably was using a figure of speech. I don't think Paul would have wanted anybody to physically pluck out their eye and give it to him. He was just saying that you'd have done anything for me. And then you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and you find out about these things that he clearly says that his thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan. He was using a scriptural terminology that described persecution from people. And you put all of this stuff together and it does not say that Paul had some sickness that God would not heal him of. Therefore, you are going to have some sickness that God won't heal you of. That's wrong. And I believe that this is an attempt by people who just, they don't have any power in their life 
they don't see the miraculous power of God, and it's an attempt to explain away their ineffectiveness and their inability to see people well. And so because of this, they try and find scriptural precedent that give them an out, an exception, so that they don't have to sit there and believe. And if you pray and if somebody dies, you have to say, well, either I'm, I wasn't believing, I'm sorry, I wasn't as strong as I need to be, or maybe you weren't as strong as you need to be. I tell you, there is people today hate to bear responsibility. They hate it. And if you tell them that there's anything wrong, they'll come out against you and they'll criticize you. And today it's politically incorrect. You can't say a person is overweight. You can't say they're fat. You got to say that they're weight challenged. You can't say that it's their fault. No, there's a gene that makes them this way. People aren't responsible for anything. And if they can't find anything specifically in their genetic makeup, then they just say, well, I was raised in a dysfunctional family, totally subjective based on the fact that this and that. People are refusing to accept responsibility for things. And I believe in this area of healing, people really fight against you saying it is God's will to heal because there are going to be times that people who believe God wants them well don't get well and either they suffer with something over a long period of time or they even die. And rather than accept responsibility and say, I missed it, you missed it, we both missed it. I don't know where we missed it. I don't know what it is. Rather than us have any potential for mistakes, it's just easier to say, oh, no, this was God's will. You know, I recently was listening to a, a pastor, and I'm not against this guy. I love him. We've talked about this. I don't mean to be critical, but he, he started the message by saying, but don't you ever come to me and tell me that the reason a person didn't get healed was because they didn't have enough faith. He says, I hate that. I will never tell a person that you don't have enough faith, and don't you ever tell me that. And he got really mad about that, and then he must have read five or six references during his message where Jesus said, you faithless and perverse generation. That's the reason that you aren't healed. They said, why couldn't we cast him out? And they said, because of your unbelief. And Jesus did exactly what this pastor said he would never do. And so in that respect, this pastor wasn't like Jesus in that instance. And you know what? There's a lot of people who are just adamant. No, I'd never say that a person, don't ever make a person feel like it was their lack of faith or that they didn't trust God or that somehow or another they missed it. Don't ever do that. Jesus did this all the time. Matter of fact, Matthew 17, I'm going to get to these verses and deal with them in more detail later. But in Matthew chapter 17, when they saw that his, when he saw that his disciples were unable to cast this demon out of this boy who was having seizures, he said, you faithless and perverse generation, how long am I going to be with you? How long am I going to suffer you? Jesus was not politically correct. Jesus did not uh, just, oh, I don't want to offend you. Please don't be offended. Don't, please don't feel like it was you that failed. He said, you're faithless. You're perverse. <laughs> and he said it in love. You know what? What I say may rub you the wrong way, but it's like when you pet a cat, you know, against the grain and all of their hair stands up on their back. You know how you solve that problem? You just turn the cat around and keep petting. <laughs> and, and what rubbed them the wrong way? Well, now it'll all lay down and it'll all feel good. If what I say rubbed you the wrong way, you know how to solve this? Repent. Turn around. Begin to receive the truth and this will actually go to feeling good. You know, I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but if, if somebody's missing it, the Scripture makes it very clear that it is God's will for you to be well. It's part of the atonement of Jesus. And if somebody's missing it, I'm saying it's not God that's missing it. It's not God who just wants you to suffer, who is indifferent about your pain. No, God's will is for you to be well. If you aren't well, it's not God who's not releasing His healing it's us that doesn't know how to receive. Sometimes it's through ignorance. We just never have heard, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So that's the reason I'm teaching this. But as I begin to start making these points and show that it is God's will for you to be well, and if you aren't well, it's either the devil who is stopping it, it's you who doesn't know the truth, or maybe you are actually cooperating with the devil through some sin that you're doing. You're in strife. James 3.16 says, envying in strife. Where that is, there's confusion, the devil, and every evil work. 
and you just stop the power of God. It could be just ignorance. It could be the devil. It could be you giving place to something and or any combination of those. But see, when I start saying that it's not God that's at fault, God's will is for you to be well, then immediately this makes people start being accountable. This makes people start feeling like oh, there's something I could do about this. And then they start saying, so this person that's suffering, I could have helped that. Or maybe you're the one that's suffering and you're saying, I've lived in pain for 20 years and I didn't have to do this. And you begin to start feeling guilty and condemned. I'm not telling you that you need to be condemned. God's not mad at you. I'm not mad at you, but I am telling you that you can be well. You can get up out of your wheelchair. You can walk. You can see. You can hear. You can be free. God has already provided these things. It's never God that doesn't give. It's either us that doesn't know, our ignorance has stopped us, or we are in rebellion towards it, or we've been di diverted by the things of this world and we haven't given the a priority to it, or sometimes it's just the world. We are in such a negative situation that it's just overwhelming you, and sometimes you need help from other people. There's multiple answers, but I'm saying God's not your problem. God's not your problem. You know, I've had somebody else bring up the scripture where Paul said, Trophimus, have I left at my lead them sick? And they say, well, see right there, one of Paul's companions that traveled with him was sick. And so it couldn't be God's will to heal every time. Why, why is that? Just because somebody travels with you, that means that if they get sick, it's somehow or another an indication that you, you aren't preaching the gospel or that it's some indication on you. You know, I've got people that travel with me and they get sick and I don't get sick because I've exercised myself and I believe God and I walk in health and they get sick. Is that an indication that somehow or another it's not God's will to heal everybody because somebody I know gets sick? Plus, when it says, Trophimus, have I left it, my lead him sick, that doesn't mean that he stayed sick. Maybe the guy was standing and believing for his healing, but Paul just had to go on, and he didn't want to sit around and wait until he recovered, and so Paul went on. Who knows? Trophimus might have joined him later. Boy, that, again, that is an obscure passage, and yet people take things like this. I mean, they take the thinnest little excuse to try and counter healing. And you know, I've countered probably a dozen different criticisms against healing, and if you have been honest and listened to what I've said, I believe that what I'm saying, based on Scripture, the context of the Scripture makes more sense than any of these interpretations that I've been countering. And it's people just grabbing at straws because they are so motivated to find something that will give them an excuse to be sick and not feel any responsibility or any authority to do anything about it. I'm telling you, God wants you well. Today's teaching is available in a CD or DVD album at the Andrew Womack Ministries bookstore in downtown Kampala. Just look for the big Jesus is Lord sign across from the Diamond Trust building at Shop 39 Cham Tower. You'll also find many of Andrew's other books and teaching materials available for purchase. Stop by and see us soon. I'd like to thank all of you that have visited our bookstore in downtown Kampala, Uganda. We've had a tremendous response, not only to the product, but a lot of people are getting ministered to. So I want to thank you for making that a success. And I also want to remind you that you can get the CDs and the DVDs of today's teaching, as well as all of my teachings right there in the bookstore. That's kind of a hub where you could just get all of the information about our ministry that you need. So visit it in downtown Kampala, the Andrew Womack Ministries bookstore. To find out how you can support Andrew Womack Ministries of Uganda, call us at 256-701-196-484. Or you can email us at awmiug at gmail.com. Once again, that's 256-701-196-484. Or you can email us at awmiug at gmail.com. If you prefer, ask how you can support Andrew Womack Ministries when you visit our Kampala bookstore at Shop 39, Cham Tower, right across from the Diamond Trust building. The Andrew Womack Ministries bookstore has many of Andrew's teachings and materials available for purchase so make sure to stop by and see us. Don't forget that you can visit our website 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. 
On our website, you'll not only find materials from today's broadcast, you'll find a wealth of resources free for you to download for yourself and share with others. There are over 400 teachings at your fingertips and more than nine years of TV broadcast you can view right there on the web. There's also over 12 years of radio programs available for download as MP3 or for you to listen to on the web. Again, it's free as you navigate through the web pages of awme.net. We hope to see you in the bookstore soon. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more Gospel Truth. How can you resist sickness if you think God caused it? It renders you passive. Also, did you know if you believe that God is the source behind your sickness and your suffering and your pain and the financial woes that this is causing and all of these things, if you believe God is doing this, then it also affects your understanding of God's love. And you know, this is a hard point to make because this has been said so many times that um, it's like propaganda. You tell a person a lie so many times after a while it gets to where even though they can see the fallacy, there's got to be something to it because it's just something that they have heard so often. Religion has told us so often that God loves us and then in the next breath they said, so that's the reason that God made your baby with Down syndrome. That's why you have cancer is because God loves you so much. I mean, your first thought is, man, this isn't love. If we were to bring it into just, you know, God being a real person, look at it this way. If I could make your baby have Down syndrome, if I could make you have cancer, if I could cause you back pain that kept you up at night, and if I was responsible for doing all of these things, there's not a single person that would look at me and say, well, you love me. Because if I was doing these things to hurt you and cause pain and discomfort in your life, I guarantee you, you'd be displeased with me. If there isn't a civilized nation on the face of the earth that wouldn't prosecute me and put me to death or at least lock me up where I couldn't people do people damage if I was the one. My dad was a Southern Baptist preacher and uh, he committed suicide when I was five years old. And I um, didn't really understand his death at the time, but I know I kind of got mad at God. Got really mad at God, actually. I uh, decided that I was gonna run from God and I was never gonna let anybody have that much control uh, to hurt me that much ever again. If God's expecting you to bear all things, God himself will bear all things. If God is expecting you to love, Believe at all times, and you know what? God will believe in you at all times, regardless of how many stupid things we do. For a complete report on this story, go to awmi.net and click on today's news feature. Invest yourself in Andrew Womack Ministries today.